There are many TV shows and podcasts today that uh, have gained popularity, and they're all designed to capture the attention of the listeners, because what's the point of a podcast or a TV show if it doesn't capture an audience, right? If it doesn't create an audience. But out of all the different genres that are out there, and you probably have certain ones that you prefer, probably the most popular genre that's out there is true crime. Uh, TV shows such as Evil Lives Here and podcasts such as Dateline NBC have risen in the ranks when it comes to entertainment because they've taken the time to focus on different stories that are highlighting crimes, but not just any crimes, perhaps the most outrageous crimes, and that would be the crime of murder. Stories such as the Manson family has captured our attention over the years. We think about how Charles Manson and this, uh, this group that he created and these people, these followers, so to speak, which he convinced them that the world was on the edge of a cataclysmic event and the only way that that could be uh, prohibited from occurring is if a cataclysmic event happened to thwart that. And so he convinced these group of people to sneak into a home one evening and attack and kill this actress along with four other people within her home. The next day, those same culprits went into another home and killed two other people. We understand Charles Manson is, is, has been arrested and would spend forever in in prison awaiting that uh, ultimate trial, as we see, that will take place in heaven. Our heart shudders in fear when we think about places of tranquility that are designed for that, such as the Appalachian Trail and how multiple, over the course of multiple years, people have been attacked and killed while other hikers are just minding their own business hiking along. Back in 2008, there's a story of a young lady named Emerson, um, Emerson Murdoch, who was traveling, and she was brand new in the year, and she wanted to take her dog out into the northeast or the northwest section of Georgia, and so she's hiking, and she runs along uh, and meets this 61-year-old man named George. This 61-year-old man and this lady named Emerson became friends, and so they started walking along, because that's what you typically do on the Appalachian Trail. You're not fearful of anyone. You walk along, and you're friendly with people. Well, she was much more in shape than he was, and so her and her dog go around, and they hike around none other than Blood Mountain, where I've actually been, that area on Appalachian Trail. And as she came back, George was hiding, attacked her. She fought him off for a little bit, captured her, held her captive for three days, and at the end of three days took her life. Now, we could spend the entire morning going over all of these different murderous stories, and that would neither be necessary nor edifying for us because it doesn't take us much time to be able to talk about how outrageous the crime of murder is. But the question is this, why is it so outrageous? Why is it so much more offensive than any other crime that's out there? Well, because it really boils down to this. Man was created in the image of God. No other creation, no other animal, no other being that's out there for that matter is created in the image of God. And so therefore, no other uh, creation has as much clout with God than what mankind does. If you were to go through scripture, you would see in Genesis chapter 9, the flood had just ended and had gone away, and so God is having a conversation with Abraham, and he gives him the promise to never flood the earth again. It's known as the, uh, not Abraham, Noah, that's the man that was on the flood, the Noahic covenant, and that covenant is between God and Noah, and God sends out the rainbow, and he says that this rainbow is going to be proof that my promise will never flood the world again. And in addition to that, he lays out this promise for mankind. We know it as capital punishment. He's never done this before, and perhaps he has seen what has occurred before the, the flood and how the murder was just on a rampage, and this is what God tells Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 6. He says, From the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Why? God adds this, for in the image of God he made man. Well, not only did God deliver capital punishment upon man who sheds innocent man's blood, and we understand that there is a place for war. We understand that. So he's not talking about war. He's talking about just murder itself. But God also places capital punishment upon animals. And you probably didn't even know that this existed in the law. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 28, the law says, If an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. 
What's he saying there is that if a man or a, a man is attacked by an animal, the animal kills the man, then the man's responsibility is to go out and kill that animal, and in essence, waste that animal away, not eat its flesh, because that animal crossed boundary lines, killed a man, and be done with that animal. God gives capital punishment upon the animal. Now, I know that probably everything I just said this morning was not necessary because I don't think I need to stand up here and convince anyone in here that murder is wrong. You could take anybody that's not even a Christ follower that has not, does not have the Holy Spirit residing in them and they would agree with you that murder is wrong and it's outrageous because we know that the law has been written upon the heart of every man. And so I'm not going to stand up here this morning and convince you that murder is wrong. That would be unnecessary for us in our, our, our spiritual growth avenue, if you will. But as what Jesus always does, is Jesus digs a little bit deeper to this concept of murder. What Jesus does in this Sermon on the Mount is he goes beyond the physical committing of murder, and he focuses on the heart of murder that will make us uneasy in our seats if we were to look at what Jesus says when it comes to murder. Take your Bibles with me and turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue on with this study on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, I'll be honest with you, over the next couple of weeks, I am not looking forward to this. I've been dreading this since I knew we got into the time of Sermon on the Mount. Because before, what Jesus is talking about is what Christians are. Uh, what Christians are, are salt and light. They, that is what you are, that is a characteristic of what you are before the world. You are salt and you are light. Uh, when it comes to the Beatitudes, you are, uh, you are pure in heart. You are um, merciful towards those. That's what you are as a Christian. But now what Jesus does, and he really started this last week as we discovered last week, is he moves beyond to what you are to the heart of a Christian. This is what your heart ought to be if you are a Christian. And he capitalizes, really kind of introduces this as we discussed last week in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Jesus says, For I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. So why is Jesus saying this, unless your righteousness, what does this mean? As we discussed last week, it means that your righteousness has to go beyond the external as what the Pharisees were concerned about. As long as you looked the part, as long as you acted this way, you're good. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Unless it goes beyond that and you are, as the Bible talks about, circumcised, if you will, in your heart, you are transformed in your heart, you will not, cannot, it is impossible for you to enter into the kingdom of God. So something has to take place with you spiritually in order for that to happen. You can't conform into a set of rules. Church will not reform you. Going to church, which is why a lot of people fall away from the church because they try to go there to be a better person. That's not what church does. Nothing can make you a better person outside of Jesus Christ. And so he picks up the heart. He says, unless, you, unless your righteousness exceeds beyond them, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then he transitions now into the next two sections to focus on two of the most outrageous sins that we could commit, and that is murder and adultery. Murder and adultery. See, the issue is between uh, the Pharisees is that they were all good if you did not go out and physically commit the act of murder or physically commit adultery. As long as you did not physically do those things, you were fine, you were holy. Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I mean by that. He says it goes beyond just a physical act. It all begins where? In your heart. This is why I don't want to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. Because Jesus says that if you ever looked upon a woman with lust, then you have committed adultery in your heart. And I, unfortunately, let's just be real, I think that we would find very few men in our world today that have not done that at some point. Now, before the ladies are like, yeah, I know you a bunch of perverts. Let's talk about the murder aspect. Okay? Jesus says, as we'll find out here, you may not commit the physical act of murder, but if you have looked at someone and you've hated them or you've had some sort of contempt and disdain, guess what? You've committed murder in your heart. Well, that's a tough pill to swallow when we're dealing with someone that has wronged us beyond anything that anybody else could comprehend. In my study this past week, I was looking at some different I uh, probably shouldn't have gone down this rabbit trail, but I did, and I pulled back out. But I, I started looking at some of the murders that were committed over the years and the top 10 craziest murders. Again, probably something you shouldn't Google. But I was reading some of the things that were taking place, and I'm not going to give you the details, but some of them had to do with children. 
I will be honest with you. If somebody attacked my children or my wife in some way, I would find it very difficult in my heart not to hate that person. But what Jesus says here is that there's no excuse when it comes to hating someone. And so what we're going to look at here this morning is something that is going to hit the heart of every single one of us. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend before you that I have all of this together because the last thing I do is have any of this together. I would be a hypocrite, as I just mentioned earlier, if I stood up here and said there has never been a point in which I, um, which I responded to someone out of a frustration. I can't say that there is not a hatred in my heart towards anyone, but that doesn't mean that I'm holy. Honestly, that means that I have not experienced the tremendous hurt that some of you have experienced. And I'm not going to try to pretend to understand what you're going through. Some of you have been cheated on. Some of you have been lied to. Some of you have had your children taken away from you. Some of you have had a loved one that's been killed, perhaps. You've been treated in a way far beyond anything that I've ever been treated, and I do not envy you, and nor do I wish anyone else would go through the same thing that you're going through. And so I, I, everything that I say this morning will come through a heart of grace, and I'm not trying to make light of what you're struggling with and dealing with. But I do, in the heart of a pastor, I want to share the truths of God's word to help you gain freedom over that hate, to gain freedom of the bitterness perhaps you were consumed with here this morning. And so what we're going to look at here is, 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 is this topic and this discussion that Jesus has when it comes to the subject of murder, and we're going to seek to answer this question. What does Jesus equate to murder, and how can we as a Christian avoid it? The title of our message this morning is this, The Heart of a Murderer. I cannot wait to put that on YouTube because that might get more clicks than some of the other message titles. The Heart of a Murderer. Jesus begins by referring directly to the foundation of the law. Look at what he says in verse 21. He says, You have heard that it was said of those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Notice Jesus' wording. He does not say, You have read. He says, You have heard. What does that mean? Pastor Brandon, aren't you kind of being a little bit overbearing with the semantics here? No, no, it's important to look at what Jesus actually said and what he didn't say. The reason why he says you have heard it said was because he was attacking the rabbinical interpretation of the command that you shall not murder. He did not undermine the law in any way. He recognizes the fact that murder is wrong. The Bible says that in Exodus that you shall not murder. So he doesn't say you have read. He says you have heard. In other words, those rabbis would stand up there and they would proclaim the law. And he says, listen, in their proclamation of the law, they didn't always get it right. Honestly, as Jesus more or less says, most of the time they didn't get it right. Because they were telling you that as long as you did not commit the physical act, you were fine. But Jesus says the words that I'm about to share with you is going to go a little bit deeper than that. Now, as we mentioned a few moments ago, those religious leaders was, was, were either conformed to this outward, they were concerned about this outward conformity of the law. In verse 22, Jesus, pushing a little bit further, urges the people to do the first thing when it comes to this murder, and that is this, check your heart. Check your heart. Look at what he says in verse 22. He says, but whoever, or what I say to you, that whoever is angry, angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. There's a lot going on in this one verse. So let's take the time now to unpack this, and we're going to break this down into different, two different categories. Okay, the first thing, this really kind of introduces us to the, the first aspect of where murder begins in the heart, and that is this, this, this concept of anger. All right, there's this unrighteous anger that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus says that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, to be honest, some of the manuscripts omit that phrase without a cause. Depending on where the manuscripts are translated from, if you had the New King James or the King James, it was translated from the Texas Receptus, which is an old manuscript that came from a a certain grouping of the original manuscripts. They included that phrase without a cause. But some of you may be looking in your Bibles this morning and may not have that phrase without a cause if you were using a different translation. Uh, Now, now again, that doesn't change the meaning of this verse, uh, but it does talk about specifically and help us understand a little bit about the anger that Jesus is referring to. I do want to be clear. Anger itself is not wrong. The emotion of anger is not sinful. 
The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. The Apostle Paul is acknowledging the fact that you can have anger and that it is justifiable. Jesus had anger, and of course, it was justifiable. Now, what's the difference between the two? How can we tell the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger? Righteous anger is anger that stems from God's will being overthrown. Righteous anger is the emotion that we experience when God's commands and his honor is undermined or attacked. We think about laws that are passed regarding abortion and how moms can take the life of the baby. We become angry over that, over the sin, not the person. That is righteous anger because it is taking the life whom God deems as being worthy. When we become angry over God being blasphemed or heresy being preached in front of the church or, I'll be honest with you, a Christian acting hateful towards a non-Christian and we become frustrated over that, that is righteous anger. That is justifiable. There's nothing wrong with that because the source of that anger is in God and God's honor and God's commands. That's righteous anger. Unrighteous anger, for that matter, is anger that is rooted in our own selfishness and in our own will. When we have been personally attacked, when we have been uh, shown hatred in some way, when our family has been attacked and we feel personally attacked and we respond that way, that is unrighteous anger. It is anger that is rooted in our own selfishness because our own will has been overthrown or we somehow have been mistreated. What Jesus is talking about here is unrighteous anger. It is anger that we are stewing over regarding someone because of something that they have done to us. We're not mad about what they have done before God, but something they have done to us. They perhaps lied to us. They perhaps have have cheated us at work or in a relationship. They perhaps whatever, fill in the blank. They have wronged us in some way, and so we become angry towards them. What Jesus says here is that Whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is a literary style that Jesus uses here. He's building a progressive link between being angry to the climax of what unchecked anger does. As unchecked anger progresses, the punishment progresses. Jesus says that those who live in sinful anger are subject to the first step of the law process, judgment being that. If you were to think about it from a court system, if you were to commit a sin, what's the first thing that happens to you? Uh, or, or crime, for that matter. You are arrested. That's like the judge. You're being brought into judgment. You are arrested. That's the first step. Jesus says that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment. And then as things continue to progress, as we will see here, it moves from that to calling a brother raka to now calling a brother fool, and every single step progresses in its punishment. You move from danger, or you move from judgment into the council. It's like facing the jury until finally being cast forever into hell. You say, Pastor Brandon, are Christians, are they going to face that? We're going to talk about this as we continue to unpack it. So the first thing we have to keep here is that the first step of a murderous heart is unchecked anger. Sinful anger. So you do a search in your heart right now. Is there someone right now that you are angry with? Say, Pastor Brown, I'm not angry at anyone. Let me ask you a question. If they were to walk through those doors right now, what kind of emotions would be stirring up in your heart? If I was to mention this person's name, what would you feel? Check your heart. Because unchecked, unrighteous anger then progresses into unrighteous treatment. Jesus adds in verse 22, whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. The point that Jesus is making here is that unrighteous anger, if it continues to go unchecked, will always result in a greater display of hatred towards that person. And each progressive display of hatred results in a progressive punishment. Now, Jesus says that anyone that says to his brother, Raka, now what does that word mean? Honestly, we do not have an English translation of that word, Raka. That's why it says Raka in our scriptures here. The closest word that we have to that is worthless or empty. It's basically calling somebody stupid. Okay, it's, 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 just your, your, you're like, it's, it's this progression. I'm angry, and now I deem them as being somebody that I really don't want to be around. 
And that leads into this punishment of, 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 of the council. Now, if you were to look at this, if you notice Jesus' progression here, saying the word raka to someone brings on less of a progression of punishment than calling someone a fool. Why is this the case? Because saying the word raka is, is a less degree of hatred than referring to someone as being a fool. Hey, Pastor Brandon, this makes no sense. The reason why is because we speak English in a 21st century Western culture. Okay? It doesn't have the same carryover as what it did in the Eastern culture during this particular time period. But if I can explain it this way, the word raka is like a contempt you have for someone. I, I, if you look at somebody with contempt, it's like you see them and you're like, ah, I really don't, really, really don't want to be around them. I don't have much respect for them. Uh, they've really bothered me in some way. You are upset with some of the actions they've committed. Okay, that's contempt. If you were to allow contempt to continue to stew in your heart, it would lead eventually to a disdain that you have for someone. It is a full-out hatred that you have towards someone. In other words, you don't care about their life. You deem them to be completely unworthy and worthless, and they are completely and utterly below you. You may not physically commit a murder, but you have done so in your heart. Whether they lived or died, you really don't care because of the hatred that you have towards someone. That's what Jesus means when he calls somebody or you say to somebody, you fool. In that particular context, it means I want nothing to do with you. I wish you were dead. If you're to look at the progression here, it all begins with this anger. I'm angry towards someone because of something that they've done. In essence, Jesus says, listen, be careful with unchecked anger. Do not let it stew in your heart. Because if you continue to allow anger to go, you're going to move into this, this realm of contempt. I really don't want to be around this person. I don't want to talk to them because of what they've done. I really don't want to be around this person. You haven't gotten to the level of full disdain, but if it continues on and you continue to brew over it and you never forgive that person, then it moves into a level of disdain. I care nothing more than for that person just to drop dead. I will never commis uh, physically commit the murder, but you could. If you were to look at, I understand there's different levels of, of murder and all that, like if you just walk up to somebody and just did it, like that's not premeditated, but if you were to look at premeditated murder, that always carries the most severe punishment. Because this progression continues to lead on until eventually you may commit that physical act. But Jesus says before all of that, check your heart. Because if you continue to go on with anger and you have a hatred towards someone, it is going to lead up to eventually hellfire. Now the point that we're going to make towards the end of the sermon is that those that continue to live in hatred towards someone and have no, no deems of forgiveness... The Bible actually says that if they live in that way and have no love towards them and hate them, then more than likely they do not have the love of God in their heart. Because it is impossible for a Christian, the Bible says, to hate their brother and also have the love of God in their heart. Which will eventually prove the fact that you are a non-follower of Christ, and it could lead you to spend forever and eternity in hell. But we'll talk about that here in just a few moments. See, Pastor Brandon, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I have some anger in my heart right now towards X, Y, and Z. What do I do about it? Well, Jesus gives another point here, and that is to seek reconciliation. Now, that's something we don't want to hear, but Jesus says seek reconciliation. This is what he says here in verse 23 and 24. He says, therefore, if you bring gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. There are two things here that Jesus emphasizes when it comes to seeking reconciliation. And the first one is this, and that is the individual's responsibility. Look at what Jesus says. Very carefully, underline it in your Bible if you have to. Jesus says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. What's he saying here? If you remember that so-and-so is upset with you, it is your responsibility to go and make it right. That goes against everything that we want to do in our human nature and everything that society tells us. Because we come up with this notion that, hey, listen, if so-and-so is upset with me for something I did, then that's their beef. They got beef with me. They got to take care of it. Jesus says, no, 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 that's not true. 
If so-and-so is upset with you, and you know they are, then you have a responsibility to go to them and take care of that. Say, Pastor Brandon, I am not apologizing for something I did not do. Does Jesus say apologize here? No, he doesn't. Reconciliation doesn't always involve apologies. Reconciliation at times involves clearing up a confusion. Maybe somebody's upset with you because of something they thought you did. Well, you're not going to go apologize for something you did not do. You go and you clear it up. But Jesus says it is your responsibility if you remember that so-and-so has something against you, go and clear that up. There's been multiple times as a pastor where you know somebody's upset with you, right? It's not necessarily something that you've done. And, and I know you can, Mr. Hansen, you can agree with that because you've been a missionary, you've been there, right? You just are doing the Lord's work, right? And somebody's upset with you and they're not really upset with you. They're upset with God. But I guarantee you, Mr. Henson's been there and some other pastors as well, that you know that somebody in your church is upset with you. Don't sit back there and wait for them to come to you. I mean this respectfully. They may not be mature enough in their Christian walk to do that. You as a believer had the responsibility to go to them and just say, hey, listen, um, can we go grab some coffee sometime? Go sit around and talk and you bring it up to them in a loving way. I've noticed that you've been a little bit different maybe towards me and I want to know, is there anything that I have done to frustrate you? See the tone in which Jesus says here? Jesus says, put it on yourself. Put it on yourself. Like, is there anything that I have done? Yeah, this is from a practical standpoint. If we were to take, if I was to take Mike out and Mike was giving me beef, which Mike is like the furthest thing from that, but if I took him out and I said, Mike, you've had an attitude with me. What's your problem? How do you think Mike's going to respond to that language? He's going to be defensive, right? But if I took Mike out and I said, Mike, I've noticed that we used to be close and that maybe there might be something there. I, I just want to know, is there something that I've done to maybe frustrate you or upset you? I've disarmed Mike by putting it on myself. And from that point, you hear what he has to say. What Jesus is saying here is that it is your responsibility if you know somebody is upset with you to go take care of it. But this is also what Jesus says. Number two, you do this before you worship. You do this before you worship. Now, now in this context of what the audience would be listening, it would be a huge, tremendous deal. Because Jesus is speaking to them in Galilee. Galilee is a little bit of a distance from Jerusalem. Before they were ever to, you know, when they would give their sacrifice, they would have to go to Jerusalem, lay it upon the altar in Jerusalem, and take care of the sacrifice. What does Jesus say? If you go to the altar, before you lay it on the altar, you remember that someone is there, you lay it on the altar, and then you go and take care of it, and then come back. What the audience would have to do, being that their home place would be in Galilee, more than likely their beef would might have been with somebody in Galilee, they would have to leave their altar in Jerusalem, walk all the way back to Galilee, find the person that they've wronged, clear it up, walk all the way back to Jerusalem, and complete the sacrifice. We have no room to complain when we can call them on the phone, right? Jesus was making a point here, and his point was, the urgency of you reconciling is so important that it is worth you making that journey all the way back before you ever worship, clearing it up, and then going to worship. Why? Because all throughout Scripture, Jesus is all about unity within the body. If you were to back up and you were to look at the phrase here, what does he say? If you're what? If your brother has something against you. He's not necessarily in this moment talking about an unsafe person, but a person that's part of the body. As Jesus is in the garden, we see that uh, the Apostle John records this. He's having a prayer session between him and his father. It's before he's arrested, before he's tried and crucified. He prays, and he prays for his disciples, and he's praying that they would remain strong and faithful. But as he gets to John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, Jesus says this, and it'll be on your screen. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's me and you. That they all may be what? One as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and that the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. 
What Jesus is saying here is that the reason why unity is so important with the body is because a unified body of believers is a proper representation and effective representation of the unity within the Trinity. We've talked about this before. How in the world is a person going to want Christ, going to want the grace of God, if they look at a body of believers, all they do is fight and bicker and spat back and forth. And some of you have left churches that have split because of a disagreement. And I'll just say it from the pulpit because my kids aren't in here. Any disagreement within the body of Christ is a stupid disagreement. Kids aren't allowed to say that word, but they're in the other room. Any disagreement, I don't care what it is, within the body of a Christ is a stupid disagreement because it is not worth losing your testimony and an impact for those that are watching. You've heard it time and time again. It's actually a joke that churches split over the color of the carpet. Jesus says that unity is of utmost importance. The Apostle Paul adds to this, and we talk about this every time we examine the Lord's table. Uh, you have the church in Corinth, and one of the main themes within the book of Corinthians is on this unity, the unity that the church did not have. And one of the reasons why they were disunified was because of the observance of the Lord's table. So to kind of put it in historical context, and what we do on Wednesday nights, or some on Tuesdays, some on Fridays, gathering together for a meal and then having a Bible study was very similar to what they did for church back in the, uh, uh, in the New Testament. And so when they observed the Lord's table, they would gather together, they would have a meal, and then they would have the Lord's table. The issue within the church of Corinth is that they would invite the rich people first. They would come, they would observe the, the food, or they would eat the food, and it was the best food, it was the choicest of foods. They would observe that first, and then they would invite the poor people, and they would segregate themselves. The apostle Paul says, you are borderline blaspheming the holiness of the Lord's table. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, he says in verse 18, for the first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's table. He says, this is not what you're doing, even though you're supposed to be. He says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, the other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat in and drink in? Do you not despise the church of God and shame to those who have nothing? What shall we say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. You're acting like you're all spiritual and holy by observing the Lord's table when you've got all this disunity based upon your social economic class. What a shame you are to God in the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul continues on in verse 27. He says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself. So let a man eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we have would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Then he adds, therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Eat at the same time. Don't divide yourself up on this socioeconomic class. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I will set in order when I come. What the Apostle Paul is doing is he's capitalizing on what Jesus says back here in the Sermon on the Mount. If you know somebody is at odd against you, your brother, take care of it before you move into a time of worship. So we seek reconciliation. We seek reconciliation. And here's the final point here. Not only do we seek reconciliation, we do it swiftly. Well, look at what Jesus says as he closes out this section. In verses 25 through 26, he says, Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of here till you have paid the last penny. Penny, Jesus changes up the scenario, and he changes up the person in whom we have a disagreement with. Talked about the brother before, and now he uses this word adversary. Adversary being somebody that's an enemy. I would take this to mean somebody that is not a follower of Christ. And he does this uh, kind of in a way of en route to, to you being taken to court by this person. He says, if you're on your way to court, more or less, agree with the person. In other words, get things reconciled. 
so that you don't let it continue to go on. And if you were to think about the court system, every single litigation lawyer will tell you that it is far easier for you to settle out of court, far less penalties than if you were to wait till it goes to trial and you were to go before the judge and now you're at the mercy of the judge. Jesus says here, if you've got something with someone and you know they're upset, take care of it before it goes too long because if it goes too long, then you may be in a greater problem than you were before. So how can we be encouraged by all of this? As we close, Jesus, who is primarily talking to, about, to the disciples here, also recognizes the fact that the Pharisees and others will listen and hear to this. The point of what Jesus is making is not only to get to the heart of the Christian, to make sure that there's no issue between them and another person, but he's also digging at the heart of those that are unfollowers, that are not, that are not followers, that are those that are Pharisees, those that are pretend to be, those that may be harboring hatred in their heart and they have no desire to get rid of that hatred. Jesus says, listen, you need to take care of this right now because if you continue on, then you will continue festering with this hatred which will leave you, lead you eventually to damning your own very soul to spend forever and eternity in hell. Now, I can't tell your heart, I can't see your heart, but I do know this, that if you have, if you have an ought against someone and you're a follower of Christ, the love of the Lord does live in your heart. You will have a desire to somehow reconcile with that person. That doesn't mean you'll no longer be hurt. You'll still be hurt. That doesn't just go away overnight. But it'll be very difficult, if not impossible, for you to just hate someone and wish they were dead. But if you are struggling with that, and you wish more than anything that X, Y, and Z person was dead, then I would urge you, just as Jesus does, to check your heart. Because John says, and 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So we close out this morning. I would encourage you to examine your heart. What are you holding on to right now when it comes to your urge to reconcile with another person? Many of you um, are obviously live in the South now. Maybe you've grown up in the South. You've seen along the f- highways of 40 and others, you see these vines that are just everywhere. Okay? You guys know what that's called? Kudzu. Some of you know the history behind kudzu. Kudzu is not indigenous to the United States of America. It came from, I believe it was Japan. The, the purpose of kudzu many, many years ago was to bring it over from Japan, plant it to prevent erosion from taking place. And it does do that. But little did they realize that kudzu completely takes over when it's not addressed. It's the same thing with bitterness. When bitterness grabs hold in our heart, it will completely take over our heart, robbing the very joy, the very life, the very happiness that we have in life because we are consumed by this disappointment that somebody has done towards us or this situation. And I would urge you this morning to give it up to God. Don't hold on to it anymore. You may be tired this morning because you are holding on to this bitterness and you're physically worn out. You're spiritually depleted because of the bitterness that has taken over in your life. Before it ever gets to this point, I would urge you this morning to give it to God. But on that same token, if somebody you know in your mind is upset with you, you don't even know what you did. Do what Jesus says here and go and reconcile with them. Don't wait for them to come to you. You take the lead in their life, being the spiritual leader that all of us are called to be, and you go reconcile with them. Hey, what, what have I done to wrong you or hurt you in some way? I love you. I don't want this to be the case between us. Dear Heavenly Father, my prayer.